podcast where we talk to smart people, but not necessarily done by smart people. That is an awesome question. This one goes down probably on one of my top five. Hey, I like nutrition. I like to eat food. This is the coolest thing ever. We're going to do this forever. I wish I paid more attention in that class. You know, I'm going to be honest. I don't understand that. <laughs> As a man, I just, I don't get it. Welcome to welcome smartpeoplepodcast.com. To smartpeoplepodcast.com. Hello and welcome to Smart People Podcast, conversations that satisfy your curious mind. Chris Stemp here, and thanks for joining. We're taking a little bit of a detour from perhaps some of our recent shows, and we are talking about networks. And I don't really mean the kind where, you know, you go to those events and you sit around and talk to everybody and try to grow that network. No, we are talking about the fundamental principles of networking in a manner that's accessible to anyone. But what do we mean when we say networks? Well, really, it's a set of things or people that are connected to each other in a particular way. That's it. People usually think of the internet when they hear the word network, and although that is part of it, it is just a form. Again, I'm not really going to go into too much here on networks because it's not my forte. But we brought on two amazing experts, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to do this episode was because the guests we were able to get are world-renowned. So we'll be talking to Meng Chiang and Christopher Brinton. Meng is a professor of electrical engineering at Princeton. His research on networking received the 2013 Alan T. Waterman Award, the highest honor available to young scientists and engineers. He founded the Princeton Edge Lab in 2009. Chris Brinton is the head of advanced research at Zumi Inc. He received his PhD in electrical engineering from Princeton, and he is an adjunct professor in the School of Engineering at the College of New Jersey. So you can imagine some really smart guys to come explain this to us. They also recently released a book called The Power of Networks, Six Principles That Connect Our Lives. So listen up, learn something, and expand that brain into somewhere new. And if you're anything like John, you probably really, really like this. We are at smartpeoplepodcast.com. Head on over there, sign up for the newsletter, bottom right-hand corner, and feel like you are part of the crew as you get any and all inside information. All right, time to turn it over to our guests as we hear from Christopher Brinton and Meng Chiang on The Power of Networks. Enjoy. All right, well, we have a treat today because we have two guests on at once, which is only, I think, the second or third time we've ever done it on Smart People Podcast. So, Chris Brinton and Meng Chiang, I'd like to welcome you to Smart People Podcast. Thanks for being on. Thank you for having us. Great to be here. So, really, I want to kick it off. I did a little intro earlier, but I want to learn, you know, Chris was just telling me, Meng, that uh, he reached out to you randomly as just a, an undergrad student, and you were a very successful professor and PhD in electrical engineering and mathematics. You're at Princeton. Why did you answer his email? Uh, well, <laughs> first of all, Chris has been a fantastic PhD student in my lab at Princeton University. And now, as of last year, 2016, uh, he is a doctor uh, himself. Mm -hmm. So going uh, years back, uh, well, at that time, I haven't developed the habit of randomly deleting emails yet. Uh, <laughs> At that time, I still answer emails, uh, and I'm glad that I answered Chris' email. Now, that's great. And then, Chris, you were telling me a little bit, but uh, what interested you about working with Hmong? I think that, you know, as an undergraduate student, you don't necessarily know what you want to research when you go to grad school. Um, so I was, you know, looking through the websites of different professors, but just, you know, the, the way that the website was outlined and all the research was, was up there. And it all seemed really interesting to me, you know, just the idea of doing mathematical modeling and optimization in networks. And that topic just just fascinated me. And, um, you know, I knew that that's when once I saw it, I knew that that's really what I wanted to focus on in, in grad school. Yeah. And so you both are sitting in uh, the Edge Lab at Princeton. Is that correct? That is correct. Could you tell us and our listeners 
what is it that you guys do there? I mean, we all know Princeton, you know, one of the top universities in the world. What is it at the Edge Lab specifically in kind of layman's terms that you guys are working on and why are you doing it? Uh, well, uh, Edge Lab, as the name suggests, uh, is providing an edge between theory and practice. Uh, we do fundamental research here in the lab at Princeton. We also want to amplify the impact to society uh, with our research. We work on networks, uh, communication networks, wireless network, internet. We work on social networks, economic networks. Uh, and this Edge Lab uh, provides a place where uh, young talents in our students and postdocs and our partners in industry and academia can come together and innovate in networks of different kinds. Meng, I read a little bit about your background. It's very interesting. And I know you you were born in China, and then you came over and you did your undergrad at Stanford. I, is that correct? That's right. Uh, I had all my degrees from Stanford, uh, bachelor, master, PhD. I uh, obviously liked the place a lot. Yeah. Uh, well, it's hard not to like a place like Stanford. And uh, in 2003, I came over to Princeton as a, a faculty member. When you were younger, as a child in China, and I got to admit, I'm not a very worldly person yet, what interested you at the time? Did you see yourself going the route you have? And then also, how did you end up at Stanford? Well, when I was a kid in China, uh, that's in the uh, late 70s, uh, when I was born in the, uh, in the uh, early mid 80s, I had no clue of what I would like to do. And it's only in high school in Hong Kong that I learned uh, the great opportunities of uh, college experience in the United States. Uh, and uh, I applied to a number of places. I was lucky enough to be accepted by some of them. And uh, Stanford turned out to be such a fantastic place to uh, study. And uh, liked it so much, uh, I just kept on going until they kicked me out and say, there's no more degrees for you. Uh, you're done with PhD now, uh, go somewhere else. Uh, <laughs> I'm so happy that uh, I ended up at Princeton. Yeah, that's pretty funny. You kept doing school until there was no more left. Well, you guys mentioned your focus is on networks, and that is the focus of our show here, your new book, The Power of Networks, Six Principles That Connect Our Lives. And I got a chance to read it, not fully in depth because we do a lot of these, but I, I I try to get into these. And I have to admit, your book was for a uh, novice like myself. It was very relatable and very, uh, it was something, you know, a level I could understand while also providing some expanded knowledge. Was that your goal in setting out to make networks kind of more understandable to the mainstream? Let me give you a one liner that has been in my mind and I'll turn to Chris here. In my mind, there are powerful ideas, beautiful ideas behind the networks that we use every day. And we don't think that uh, you have to be a PhD student uh, or a professor to appreciate that. And we want to explain those powerful, beautiful ideas about networks in a language, in a way that we can all understand. That's exactly correct. That's exactly what we wanted to do by uh, writing this, this book. Um, you know, Mung had, had written a, a textbook uh, a couple of years earlier, um, a, a more undergraduate, uh, junior, senior level undergraduate in um, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, STEM discipline on networking. Um, and that had required linear algebra, calculus in order to fully understand. Um, and the, the whole idea of this book kind of came from that experience of teaching that class and I uh, was a TA for, for that class, both uh, at Princeton and also um, online. We have a massive open online course uh, running for that course on um, Coursera's platform. And what we observed was a lot of the students who didn't necessarily have the mathematical background, you know, still really wanted to know uh, about networks. So we, we decided to see if we could figure out a way to explain this stuff in a way that didn't require all the advanced math. And what we found out was that you really don't have to be in STEM to understand the key principles that underlie networks. So let me ask you this. Before we get into the just basic question of what a network is, why is it important that most people know what they are? I mean, of course, we're familiar with 
networking, right? That's been something people have been saying for a long time or social networks and all of that. But why do you think it's critical that the average person understands at a slightly deeper level what a network is, what the power of it is, and how they're used in our lives? Yeah, I think that a lot of times when people think about networks, they tend to think of technological networks. You know, they, they'll think of the internet, they'll think of, you know, wires that run out of your house and that go into this, you know, big, big network that connects all of us in some way. But it's not just tech networks. It's, you know, it's also social networks, uh, which are becoming much larger today. Um, economic networks having to do with you know, how stuff is priced and then tech networks too. And a lot of the pretty much anything I think that we do today can be related back to a network, right? I mean, when you're on your smartphone, I mean, there's so many different networks that are that are connected to, to that phone at one time, you know, whether it's the internet, whether it's your local area network, when you're sending out a text message or making a call, you know, the telephone network that runs that. And um, just everything that we do today increasingly is becoming more and more networked. And I think by understanding that, you can get a lot of insights into how our lives work fundamentally. You know, I mean, whereas several years ago, networking wasn't as big of a thing, but today it's really, I think, everything. Let me ask you, one of the things I've been contemplating a lot recently is, you know, this idea of networks and being interconnected, everything, right, through different mediums, like you said, cell phones and social media and the shows we watch and the things we do, yet I feel there is a growing kind of pervasive feeling of disconnection to some extent. People utilizing technological networks at the expense of interpersonal networks at all. Have you guys ever thought about that? I know you're very tech focused, so I get that. But I just want to see it from your perspective, from the mathematical perspective, um, if you've given any thought to that. <laughs> well, uh, first of all, at a personal level, uh, Chris, uh, I'm uh, among those who are addicted uh, to the cell phones <laughs> uh, and to well, social networks to some degree, not as crazy as some of the others, perhaps. But you know what? Um, uh, I, I'm addicted. I, I have to admit that. Uh, and I think a lot of people are like that. Uh, there is uh, adverse impact as a result of that addiction to our interpersonal face-to-face -face communication, uh, to uh, actually talking to each other like what we are doing now. Um, and I personally want to do more of that. Um, the mathematics of networks, especially social networks, uh, actually started uh, before we had all these cell phones and uh, social media and video streaming uh, over the internet and mobile network. None of that existed when people started to study networks of human beings. Now, on the one hand, uh, these kind of uh, online social networks uh, and uh, technological networks has made the subject as a research and teaching subject of networking, really fascinating. On the other hand, there are people who actually, not us directly, ourselves, but uh, people who uh, have started to study uh, how uh, the impact of having tech networks is adverse on face-to-face -face, uh, networks. So when I think of network, it's not just the internet. Uh, social network existed before online social networks. So socially, you know, I think I'm addicted. I want to, uh, you know, get some help. Uh, and uh, mathematical study, yes, people have been studying both kinds and how one impact the other. Define for us really quickly the network in the sense that you that you want us to think about it in the in the way that this book is structured. Because you talk about you know e-commerce and uh, crowdsourcing and Google and SEO ranking and all that as being parts of a network. How do they fit into that, and how would you define network? Well, you know, a network in general is quite simple to uh, think of. Uh, there are nodes and there are links. The nodes could be the web pages, and the links are the hyperlinks. And the way that these nodes uh, are connected can lead to things such as Google's ranking uh, of your search. Uh, the nodes could be people or their opinion, uh, and the links 
uh, could be the way that uh, these people or opinion influence each other. You have a crowd, and how would a part of the crowd's opinion uh, propagate through the crowd and influence others' thinking? And that's uh, in our chapter in the book uh, relating to you know, when can I trust Amazon's product review? Hmm. Uh, back to what is a network. The nodes could be our cell phones and the towers, cell towers, uh, or the routers behind them. And the links could be a wireless link, a copper wire, a fiber link. And then you have all kinds of interesting functions running on this network that support the internet as we know it today. So, in short, uh, networks is a bunch of nodes connected by links. And the nodes could be all kinds of stuff and, and the links could be all kind of concepts, uh, whether it's a physical link, or it's a relationship link, and if you look at the links and the nodes connected by them, they tell you a lot of interesting stories. Some stories that we can relate to, as you said, Chris, in our day-to-day -day life. Should I buy this plasma TV or, or should I buy the other one? Things that uh, uh, we don't feel the network but is impacting us. Like you search for something on Google and, well, one result shows up before the other result. And things by now, 2017, we take for granted that you can stream Netflix on your phone, uh, that uh, you can upload a picture on Facebook from your laptop through a Wi-Fi. Things that we think are as intuitive as water and electricity flowing. And now in this book, we explain uh, the kind of big ideas that gave us all these uh, wonderful utilities we take for granted today. You know, it's a really interesting point there, as you were talking about, we take it for granted. And I, I think this goes to, you know, you have six principles that connect our lives here. The first one you talk about sharing is hard and how to share network resources efficiently. And this hit home for me a, a couple of weekends ago, I'm at a winery and I'm looking and they don't have, they don't offer Wi-Fi. And so I pull a guy aside and I said, look, man, how do you not have Wi-Fi? It's 2017, like there's hundreds of people here. And he just said to me, he said, okay, here's our issue. Our bill would either be too high, our network would be too slow, or people would be huddled around the routers instead of outside enjoying the scenery. And I realized I was so upset that I couldn't get Wi-Fi in this massive two-building 20 acre place that we do take for granted having networks everywhere. But what is the restraints behind, you know, still it is 2017, our ability to have things like Wi Fi or even cell service all over the place? What's going on there? I'll provide part of the answer and uh, turn to Chris. Part of the uh, constraint is that these wireless services, they use spectrum. So think of the air. Right. And look at the, the visible light that uh, allows us to see things. Uh, that's part of the so-called spectrum okay, in particular frequency. You look at AM, FM radio, that's different frequencies. And similarly, Wi-Fi uses some other frequency. And uh, 4G uses some other frequency. But we only have a limited amount of spectrum. And we've got to use it in a very smart way. And I have to say that the way that the spectrum policy and way spectrum are used today, say in this country or in many countries, uh, may not be the smartest way yet. But that's just one part of the puzzle. Another part is the way that uh, existing fixed chunk of spectrum is shared by a lot of people trying to squeeze in and use the spectrum. And sharing is hard. Indeed, try to illustrate that problem with pictures. You see that in our book, we have a lot of pictures. I think we have what, over 200 pictures, almost one picture every book. You know, any more pictures becomes a cartoon book. And uh, that's actually not a bad idea. We're thinking about that now. And we want to illustrate the idea that sharing is hard, but can be done if you're smart, uh, if you're smart with your network engineering. And Chris? Yeah, yeah. To, to address the specific issue there, too, of being in a winery, um, I can I definitely relate to that. I actually, when I, I got married like two and a half months ago and we did the after party at a winery mm. and there was Wi-Fi there. Yeah. <laughs> I understand that. 
Um, so you were busy looking for Wi-Fi to, uh, to work <laughs> after your well, wedding. Uh, you know, you know. I, I like your work. Yeah, ethic. yeah, you like my work. That's why you. I. That's why you let me do my piece. <laughs> <laughs> but with Wi-Fi, the way that Wi-Fi works, so the main issue presented to Wi-Fi is the fact that it doesn't scale well. You know, beyond a few users sharing a single access point or a single router. And I was thinking of this the other day when um, planning a, a trip actually to uh, Disney World. I was thinking to myself, well, why don't they just add more routers then, right? Why don't they just add more routers? But the problem is that then you'd have the routers colliding with each other too, right? And so the way that Wi-Fi technology works is we're all trying to share on a single spectrum. We're all trying to, whenever we transmit, um, we're, we're running the risk of colliding with someone else. And there's this whole idea of, of negative feedback that we all have to, or all of our devices have to abide by, um, which is the idea that they will try to sense and see whether other people are, are transmitting within their same vicinity. This is specific to Wi-Fi technology and the way Wi-Fi works. So what ends up happening is that as there's more and more people uh, more then more and more people want to be transmitting to that same access point or to different access points in the same vicinity, but they can still impact one another. They can still collide with one another. So everyone ends up having to what's called back off or send at a much, much shorter, smaller frequency. Um, so therefore, we all start to experience these really, really slow bit rates because there's, there's not a, a central coordinator with Wi-Fi that's really telling us when to transmit and how long we should be transmitting for. It's all done in a distributed manner. We're all de our devices are all trying to discover this and trying to do that in a way that, that will work not only for them but for everyone else at the same time. They're trying to coordinate with one another. And the, the drawback of having this type of distributed method is that a lot of times it can't scale to a really large number of users. And that's probably why what they're seeing in, in the winery case, why they don't have Wi-Fi, because they don't want people to be complaining that the Wi-Fi signal is, is not good. Or right. That the transmission rates aren't good. So what's the solution to that? What's going to come next, finally, to give me Wi-Fi everywhere I need it, when I need it, and in the same token with, um, with my cell phone? Because that's the one that might piss me off even more. <laughs> well, there are, there are a few interesting ideas out there. Uh, you know, one... Uh, is uh, what we call fog networking uh, or fog computing. Uh, we talked a little bit about it uh, in this book because that's more on the cutting edge of research and development. Uh, <clears throat> but it's gaining a lot of momentum. Uh, actually, I'm a co-founder of a, a nonprofit global consortium between industry and academia called Open Fog Consortium. Uh, and the idea is that the cloud is descending to be among the people and the things in the Internet of Things, uh, and how do we think about architecting and building and running uh, such networks? Now, one particular aspect of fog uh, computing is that uh, you can allow devices around you to pool their idle resources and help you. It's like Uberizing the idle resources of connectivity, and that will give you a, a bigger bundle of a larger pipe. Uh, of connectivity. Now, another idea is to make uh, a cellular network. You know, our 4G or the future 5G uh, cellular network work like a Wi-Fi network. Now, today we have that, but often it's uh, sometimes a bit slow. Sometimes it costs you uh, too much, and uh, Wi-Fi tend to be free if you can have it, right? Uh, so, another idea is to say, well, maybe. With smarter data pricing, we can turn a cellular capacity and the way that people use 4G as if they're using a, a Wi-Fi. Uh, we do actually have a whole chapter on smart data pricing in our book, How Economic Networks and the Economics of Technological Networks Can Get Smarter uh, Coming Up. So with all these different approaches, hopefully, look, Chris, next time you go to winery, uh, you can enjoy the Wi-Fi. Although I don't think that's the best use of time in wine. <laughs> I think hey. I, I don't even know what I was looking up. You know, it was probably something to do with wine. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> but 
alcohol is probably better than Wi-Fi. <laughs> That's true. That's the one thing, Mung. You and I might agree on that. I, you know, I'm liking you already. So, you know, the other thing I want to get into, and maybe it's kind of just walking through these six principles a little bit, but you talk about ranking. First of all, you say ranking is hard. So I'd love to know why you think it's hard. And then I want to dive into specifically the Google algorithm and your take on its efficiency. So let me know what you think about that. Well, let me take the general one, and Chris uh, can take the tougher one on Google. Uh, <laughs> uh, now, uh, generally, ranking is hard because uh, if you look at the crowd, and if you zoom in, look at the way that the individuals in the crowd are connected in a social or technological networks, it's a bit confusing as to which is better and which is more important. So we gave three examples in that chapter of our book. One is in the network of web pages. Which one is more important? Uh, and Google has a way to help us think about that. And I think it's a powerful way. It's a beautiful way. Now, another version of the question is, on Amazon, I look at competing products. Right, This toy got uh, uh, four and a half stars, but three reviews. The other one got four stars, about 100 reviews. Now, which one should I trust more? In this crowd of reviewers, we uh, look at some beautiful ideas behind how we weigh uh, the average score versus the number of reviewers there in ranking on Amazon. And the third example is you know, ranking movies and TV shows to recommend to you on Netflix. Now, sometimes as I'm amazed as how accurate Netflix knows my movie taste, which is very bad. But nonetheless, <laughs> Netflix was able to use data uh, and understand that. And part of that is a decade ago, Netflix Prize. It's an interesting story on how Netflix asked the research community, hey, can you help us improve? That's before streaming. They're still shipping on the ma in the mail you know, with a DVD. Help us improve prediction. Because if Alice and Bob say, they both like a certain kind of movie, and now I know Alice liked this new movie that Bob hasn't watched yet. I may want to recommend Bob to watch it, right? That's using the social network interactions to recommend movies uh, with a rank of alternatives. So those are three really interesting examples that touch our lives on a daily basis. And you know, for my kids, my, my daughter, my son, uh, watching Netflix kids movie uh, nonstop, you know, this touches their life on an hourly basis. Now, as to the Google example, Chris uh, uh, can take that up. Well, really sure. quick, really quick, Chris, because I, I do want to dive into Google because uh, I think it's fascinating. I have some thoughts there. but And maybe this is to, to talk towards that. But, Mung, as you just talked about the ranking thing and recommending movies and products and all the recommendations that are going on, have you guys formulated any thoughts, opinions, research on what that's doing to maintain kind of the, the, the status quo. I mean, if you like a certain type of movie and it just keeps getting recommended to you, you may not step out of that genre. You might not expand your, your horizons. And so have, did you, do you guys think that's a potential downside of this at all? It's, it's a very, very interesting question, Chris. In fact, I asked almost the same question, exact same question to Eric Schmidt. Mm. So uh, if you want to know what Emmett, Eric Schmidt said, uh, please buy our book. Uh, <laughs> so we actually interviewed four visionary leaders, Eric Schmidt, uh, Google, uh, former CEO, and now the uh, chairman of Alphabet, uh, parent company of Google. We interviewed uh, Vince Cerf, Bob Kahn, the fathers of the internet, uh, who invented TCP IP network protocol. Uh, we interviewed uh, Danny Striegel, who was the CEO of Verizon Wireless and made a lot of decision on 4G networks, among others. In the Eric Schmidt interview, I asked Eric this question. Now, Eric's answer, which is brilliant, you can read in our book. My quick answer is, you know, there's a bit of concern of that, but at the same time, smart algorithms, smart network algorithms will also give you uh, a taste of things you wouldn't think of. They won't give you a whole lot of those, but they will give you a little bit of that. That ties actually, Chris, right back to the Google PageRank, because small chunk of Google's PageRank 
output is actually derived from what they call random walk. They actually uh, would spread in a little bit of randomization, a bit of a mutation in the genetic pool so that you don't end up being too homogeneous uh, and confine yourself to what you were in the past. Yeah, and where that brings me, it's an excellent question, is um, in, in machine learning, there there's um, a whole class of algorithms that are called reinforcement learning algorithms. And what those algorithms essentially do is there's a trade-off between exploration and exploitation. Exploitation is using what you've already known to work well. Like in the case of Netflix, it would be, we know this person already has these set preferences. We know they tend to like this type of movie. We know you tend to like this type of product. Then there's also exploration, which is trying to look at what you don't already know and what the algorithm hasn't already learned about, in this case, the person. And that's done through randomization. They're trying to throw someone just some random recommendations every once in a while to see if you can just learn more about that person. It's not You're not doing it because you believe that this person may necessarily like this type of movie. You're just doing it because you want to find out whether they like it or not, so that you can update your model about that person. In terms of Google itself, uh, do we want to... Yeah, no, I, 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 let's dive into them. I mean, because think about how they are the, the gatekeeper of essentially all of the information we consume in the world, pretty much. I know, it's, it's, it's awesome. So Google, the way I try to describe Google is that there's, there's two main aspects of that algorithm, and this is focusing on Google search. You know, Google does a lot more than just search nowadays, but just focusing on Google search, which we use every day. Um, there's two main components of, of how that works. Um, the first one is trying to determine relevance. So what Google does is Google, Google has an index of, we, we tend to think of Google's index as the entire World Wide Web. That's not necessarily the case. I mean, there's some web pages out there that Google probably hasn't discovered or hasn't indexed. You know, but there's literally trillions of web pages. So when you consider all different variations on web pages, there's a lot of um, thinking around that too. What's the right way to quantify a quote unquote web page? Mm. But uh, depending upon how you do that, if you look at the lowest layer, there's literally trillions of different web pages out there that they would have in their index. And their index is basically just a, a store of all of these different pages and what URLs they're at. So the relevance score is looking at the content of these different web pages versus what you're searching. You know, so if you search, say, you know, I don't know what you want to search for, um, new plasma TV or new HD TV or something like that, um, Google will look through all the different web pages and count, you know, how many times this different search appears, you know, uh, in those different pages and come up with what's called a, a relevance score which is basically then a way to filter out and say, you know what, these pages, these, you know, 99% of pages, 99.9999% of pages that don't actually mention, you know, HDTV, plasma screen, we, there's no need to serve those up, right? You know, they don't have anything to do with what the person's searching for necessarily. Beyond that, it becomes, well, how, does, how do they take the search results that they actually do return and rank them, right? How do they come up with that ranking? How is it that within the first 10 or so results, for most things that I'll tend to search, I usually won't have to go past the first page to find what I want. Right. And the way that they do that is they, they take into consideration what's called the importance of the web pages. The importance score, interestingly, is actually independent of the content on the page. It has to do with the network of web pages that we had mentioned before and uh, Mungan mentioned in uh, one of the previous uh, spots about uh, one of the types of networks that really underlies a lot of this. And this is the idea of a web graph. A web graph is a network of web pages and how they're connected through their hyperlinked structure. So uh, a Wikipedia page, for example, will have a lot of outgoing links to many different sources, right? Because uh, Wikipedia will tend to reference a lot of other pages, a lot of different pages. And then what, what happens is Google finds what's called a page rank score, and that's actually uh, named after uh, Larry Page, who was one of the founders of page rank, a pun on his name, or sorry, one of the founders of Google. It's a pun on his name, uh, page rank, ranking web pages. And what they'll do is figure out the importance score. It takes into consideration 
how many other important pages are pointing to a given page. And it solves a huge system of equations um, through very efficient computations. So to your point about how efficient is their algorithm, I think it's extremely efficient because of the fact that they can solve these systems of equations in literally milliseconds, right? Mm -hmm. to, to actually serve up and rank the list of pages based upon what, what you've searched. Um, so I, you know, I don't think you can argue that Google's algorithm is not efficient just based upon how many people use it and how effective it is today. What I, one thing I do think that um, a way Google could be enhanced, and this is, um, I don't want to get off topic too much here, but um, it's the whole idea of being able to serve up a, a personalized set of results that's not necessarily just a list of results, but actually maybe the sequence of results that you should look at, right? Um, so right now when you search something, you just get you know, a ranked list of results and then you maybe go through them, not necessarily in any particular order. But it would be really cool to me if there was a way of actually organizing that information, say, across different web pages in a way that would fit the person, the specific person that's searching. Yeah, that is a unique way of looking at it. And I never thought about it that way. If I asked a question and they could almost walk me through it via different results. Yeah. Chris, if I if I were to say in 24 hours, I want you to create a web page on blank that was ranked at the top of Google, would you be able to do it given all that you know? <laughs> and if so, no. how? Let's get that out. <laughs> Def definitely not. Uh, I would, you know, <laughs> you'd have to. That's a really interesting question. But probably the first approach that I'd do is I'd, I'd start searching through uh, for the the most popular web pages and I'd you know, call up someone at Amazon and try to pay them to hyperlink to my web page. Ah, <laughs> I see. You know, that's that's SEO optimization. I mean, a lot of, you know, the way that you promote yourself in the rankings, if you wanted to do it, is you want to have a lot of important web pages pointing to your web page. Mm. I, I mean, I know a lot of people talk about the backlinks and everything. I didn't realize per se, and I'm not a, you know, I don't know a lot about this, but that the strength of the website recommending you is a big part of it. It certainly is. Um, that's if you look at the way that PageRank is done. It's uh, on this whole concept of actually spreading importance scores, um, where web pages kind of pass their importance scores to other web pages, and then you wait until the network converges at a set of importance scores that's consistent across the entire network. Um, really, if you have one page that's really important, spreading its importance score to you that's going to really do a whole lot for your importance score. Mm. And that's granted that that web page itself isn't already pointing to billions of other web pages. Right. Because then it's spread <laughs> right. amongst those other pages. But if you, if you can find a web page that's actually really popular and doesn't have a lot of hyperlinks coming out of it, uh, that I think would be the, the guy you'd want to go to and say, hey. <laughs> yeah, hey, no. I know. I'll do you a couple favors, whatever you need, just, you know. <laughs> Link to me, please. Just throw a link out there. <laughs> no, that makes sense. Mung, I know you have to take off in a minute, so I want to ask you one last question before you go. What are you excited about in the future? That the What problems might networks be able to solve? Well, there are many exciting opportunities, but uh, you asked me to uh, give you a quick answer, I guess, right? <laughs> well, it doesn't have to be quick. I just know you have to go soon. <laughs> well, yeah, well, <laughs> Uh, and I think that uh, it's uh, probably better just to give one example rather than a whole laundry list of things. Sure. And that's what I think um, is uh, extremely exciting is uh, the combination of embedded artificial intelligence with fog networks. I mentioned before that uh, when the cloud is sent to be among the things and the people, it becomes a fog. And fog computing is an emergent, exciting area of research development and business. So one of the driver applications for fog computing is to do embedded artificial intelligence so that you don't need to go to the cloud all the time, that you can do AI, machine learning, right here, right now. And you can do that for consumers, you can do that for industrial applications, uh, you can do that for smart cities, it requires a combination of a very efficient network among the Internet of Things, 
it requires efficient network of the data points. Very different kind of network, not a physical network of wireless links, but a conceptual network of ideas and data points and relationships. You just draw them out like a graph and try to understand all the things that you can run on top of it. So you put artificial intelligence together with fog networks. That's going to revolutionize a lot of the way that we we uh, we live our lives and uh, run our study, uh, our work today. So one minute version would be, uh, I think, embedding AI capabilities into the fog networks. That's hugely exciting. Oh, that um, it's exciting or kind of terrifying if you don't understand it very well, but. To try to uh, understand it as much as we can, yeah. uh, just like you know uh, the pioneers that, uh, including those we interviewed in this book, uh, talked about what they did 40, 50 years ago, mm -hmm. uh, so that we have the internet and the mobile and all the overlay networks like online social networks we have today. Uh, but you know what, Chris, it's uh, it's exciting. It's exciting time for the students, uh, but also exciting time for all of us who use the network. You know one. A pity that I sometimes uh, uh, see people telling me is that uh, they say, I use all these networks. Right? I, I stream video, I, I do Skype, and I complain about the lack of Wi Fi or the speed of the 3G and 4G, you know. Uh, and I wonder, uh, how did Amazon know my shopping taste so well? You know, but uh, I, I don't want to go through all the math, I want to read normal English, and uh, I want to see some pictures and get the big ideas and understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, so we tried, Chris and I, in this book to strike a delicate balance between uh, giving you enough real stuff, not just wishy-washy, hand-wavy. You know? There's real meat here. But at the same time, make sure that uh, uh, we don't lose you. Uh, and after reading this book on the plane or you know at the end of the uh, a long day and you say wow actually I you know 10 pages into a chapter I, I, I learned something and now I know what's going on behind the scenes of the, all the network I'm using well Chris and Mung, this has been um, interesting again the book is the power of network six principles that connect our lives wanted to know if there's anywhere else are you guys doing a lot of writing or can we kind of keep up to date on what you're doing, the Edge Lab, anything like that? Or are you just heads down and you don't tell anybody what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> no, we actually, we have a website um, on the book. It's, it's called um, powerofnetworks.net, uh, www.powerofnetworks.net. And uh, we blog there. Um, we tweet there. Our, our um, tweets get put up there when we uh, from our Twitter account. Sure. Twitter is also at power underscore of underscore net. Uh, which you can get right from the website. There's also instructional material up there if you want to take this and use it, say for uh, even a high school class, I would say, or an introductory um, college class. But uh, you know, we're very active on on that website and trying to update what's going on and put new networking stories that we find in there too. Um, so I would say the best way is definitely to go to www.powerofnetworks.org. Dot org, dot net. Dot org, yeah, they yeah, both, both work. Yeah, both yeah. Dot, dot org and dot net. And you know what? I've actually talked to high school students. I've given uh, seminars to high school students based on this material. And uh, uh, I think they actually completely got it. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, love to uh, do more of that. And uh, um, the website contains all that info and a way to get uh, in touch with us too. Fantastic. Well, thank you guys so much. Have a great day. Thanks, Chris. All right. Thanks, Chris. Bye-bye. Bye. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that episode with Christopher Brinton and Meng Cheng. Their book, The Power of Networks, Six Principles That Connect Our Lives, can be found at your local bookstore and on Amazon. And if you decide to go through Amazon, please make sure to use the Smart People Podcast Amazon link located at smartpeoplepodcast.com dot com slash amazon as this is a free podcast we could always use your help and we're so grateful to those of you that do help out the show 
Anytime you use the Amazon link, it comes to no cost to you and gives us a nice little kickback. And of course, there are so many other free and easy ways to support the show. You can head over to iTunes and leave a rating, review, and comment over there. It means the world to the show, and it truly does help. So if you could take a couple minutes out of your day and do so, both Chris and I would really appreciate that. If you're looking to get in touch with the show, you can shoot us an email at smartpeoplepodcast at gmail.com or message us on Twitter at smartpeoplepod. If you'd like to keep up with all things Smart People Podcast, please head over to smartpeoplepodcast.com and sign up for the newsletter over there. We promise not to spam you. As a matter of fact, we only send a couple emails a month or every couple months, so it's, it's not that much anyway. All right, as always, we've got some great interviews coming up, so we will see you all next episode.